Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Welcome, Bruce. Hey, David. And again, uh, in my, you'll see me looking down at the bottom corner of my screen, look, looking down there, because there's little Bruce, little tiny Bruce face <laughs> that I talked to during this broadcast. I don't and, understand uh, it. I don't understand because on my screen, I also have a little tiny Bruce face down in the corner, which is great. That's all I want. But you're the big, big guy in the middle of the screen and the uh, with the uh, gleaming pate in the middle of my screen. And uh, <laughs> well, you've heard of Big Brother is talking to you. Well, this is this is you no know, Big Brother is watching you. This is Big Mouth is talking to you. Yeah, well. <laughs> So I, I kind of look through the camera at you. So if it looks like I'm staring at the camera, it's kind of a little bit of both, I guess. Anyway, um, it's nice. So here Monday, and we actually got new stuff to talk about. Bruce, there hasn't been this much hockey news in August in Edmonton in about 30 years. So <laughs> I, that's probably a good thing, of course. Um, so three yeah. things have happened in the last week, and we'll we'll touch on all of them. The first thing, Andre Sekera, some terrible news for him and for the team. He uh, uh, tore his Achilles tendon in training, had surgery, and is out indefinitely, and who knows what's going to happen there. So the Oilers were left scrambling. Uh, they were counting on Secker. I think you had him penciled in on your third pairing. That's where I kind of saw him behind Clefbaum and, and Nurse realistically, although hopefully, you know, I was, had this wild hope that he might completely bounce back to the player he was before. Uh, mm -hmm. That never left me, although it wasn't strong. Uh, so he's he's gone, and the owners have kind of made two moves. Um, maybe they're both related to him being out. Scotty Upshall, veteran forward, signed on a PTO, and uh, he's a thirty. He'll be thirty-five this year, um, and um, played in St. Louis for a long time. He's a veteran, a fourth line guy. Uh, he's a good skater, a hitter, and a penalty killer. And today, just now, the Oilers have signed depth defenseman Jakub Yarabek. Is that his name? Uh, oh. A Czech hockey player, if I'm not mistaken. Let me just check that. Let me just check if he's Czech. He could be Slovak. Uh, uh, he is uh, Pizen. Okay. Czech Republic. Uh, Pizen? Yeah, I'm not sure, Bruce. Uh, Long-time Czech League player, strong offensive def offensive hockey player in both the Czech League and the KHL. Very strong, actually, his numbers there. You know, he's putting up about uh, two points every three games at that uh, level of play. And um, came over to the NHL last year, played with two teams, kind of bounced around. He had kind of a Johan OV2 first year in the NHL. He, he's... There's a lot of similarities between him and Johan Ovi mm -hmm. too, in terms of being uh, older European defensemen, kind of in the prime of their careers, yep. who aren't known for the defense, who are known for their puck moving, had a lot of success in Europe, moving the puck, putting up some points, and are trying to somehow see if they can catch lightning in a bottle in the NHL where the real money is made. And it, and it has happened. I mean, didn't watch just, – just I didn't watch a ton of the playoffs, honestly, Bruce. I was so sick of hockey after the older season last year. But didn't the, the Washington Capitals happen on a kind of a second pairing defenseman from this school of hockey who who became a key part of their team? Um, I'm just might have to Google yeah. it. Who what yeah. was his name? The guy oh, they got from yeah. Chicago. Yeah, Michael. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Stop. Uh, uh, he did. He, uh, they got him at the trade deadline from Chicago, and he went on to become a real solid. Uh, um, Actually, he played on Kempney. the team. Kempney, right? Mike, oh, Michael Kempney. Kempney? Yeah, that's it. That's it. And he had uh, he wound up on the first pairing. You know, I mean, I'm not sure where and exactly for minutes, but uh, he was a solid part of their team. They got him for next to nothing at the trade deadline. And like you say, he, he somewhat fits the, the mold. Yeah, every now and then there's a, there's a player like this. And who knows how, how long they do it for. But who comes over and and um, you know he's he's really established himself as a strong player in the uh, European leagues and he comes over and uh, it's often the success isn't immediate but for a year or two or three will really be a, a, a useful hockey player for a team and man Bruce the Oilers um, 
they needed this. They needed both to bring in a defenseman with Sekar out, and they needed to bring in, I believe, this kind of player as well. Someone who can move the puck. Because Brandon Davidson was a really interesting choice, and, and I, I like that idea. But at the same time, part of me was thinking they need someone who's a better puck mover than Brandon Davidson. Because that's the, that really is the NHL game. And the owners, man, they're lacking in that kind of player on the blue line. So um, this kind of player has that reputation. So maybe it's going to work out. It's her, I think it's a really sharp piece of business by Peter Shirelli. Yeah, I'm happy with both pieces of business by Shirelli. Yeah. So I, I mean, we'll talk about the other one as well. But uh, uh, I think you know, managing around the margins, um, which is basically what what he's left himself would be, you know, one one way to put it. Uh, but he's uh, he's shown some real savvy this summer. I think they've added some, you know, some real honest to goodness hockey players. Or at least people who've got a you know a real solid chance of being hockey players, uh, with a limited budget, and uh, uh, I'm I think they've added to their depth. They've certainly added to their their sort of veteran level, and I mean obviously Yarabik and Sakara are on different pages, but Shirelli, uh, uh, it's not you know it's not not his fault that uh, Sakara is Achilles blue. Uh, he's just got to deal with it, and the way the the way that long term injured reserve is, you know, that's a that's a fund that they're going to be able to dip into. But uh, Charlie has to play his cards right, as I understand it, to keep Sekera's contract on the roster to start the season. If he can do that and then put him on LTIR, they're way more flexible than if they just put him on to begin the season. How does that work, Bruce? Do you oh, do you actually know how it works? Am I am I putting you on the spot too much here? Because uh, well, I don't, no, I, I don't no, know how that works. No, you're so. not. And I, th that, that in a nutshell seems to be how it works. Apparently, I mean, I read part of the CBA section. That was brutal. And then uh, it, it apparently most of the rules aren't actually covered in the CBA. There's some kind of side document or agreement or whatever. And I read a guy, a guy on Twitter. He said he worked for a bank and his his job was perfecting 180 page documents for big big loans and he said that section of the cva gave him a headache so i'm not going to apologize for <laughs> for not uh, having a full and utter grasp of the cva i mean on my best days that's a that's a tall tall ask and uh this particular clause is one of the more devious ones in there but the the, the upshot of it seems to be if you can keep the guy's salary, if you can fit him under the salary cap to start the season, then then put him on IR on day two, then you're you're good to go. So it may be the Oilers have, if they have another deal in the work, they they might want to wait until day two to make it. Because there's there's been some heavy rumors. Well, not some heavy rumors. There've been some rumors about Justin Falk. So we've mm -hmm. heard them for some time as a player of interest. Yes. You know, Bob Stoffer, the Oilers was playing them down, um, talking about. Falk's plus minus and the fact that Falk played so poorly against the Oilers kind of downplaying that in the last couple of months but then last week came on the radio and really played it up uh, putting out there the notion that um, Falk has a 4.8 million dollar cap hit but it, it, he's getting paid six million dollars a year and a, a budget team like Carolina might not be interested in paying that amount of money so yeah maybe a week into the season we see something with a player like Justin Falk I mean he his price can't be that high Bruce he's he's still on the market after all this time they didn't get very much for Skinner they got a decent prospect in Cliff Pugh and a second round draft pick and some some draft pick change so to speak right. and you know Falk's price can't be more than that it's not going to be more than that and it, it could be, be less, less than that less I think I mean, yeah, they're, given they're, his, they're looking at two more years of that. Uh, I'll call it an overpay in the sense of it being six million versus four point eight, and many would argue the four point eight cap hit is an overpay in its own right. Uh, this is a player with defensive weaknesses, um, but assuming the Oilers aren't themselves a budget team, and I've been hearing varying rumors about that. Uh, that uh, they can afford to pick up a guy whose actual payroll is higher than his cap hit and be more concerned about the latter than the former. Uh, they may well be able to acquire a player like that for relatively cheaper, especially from a budget team like Carolina, 
for acquisition costs, and it's more a matter of making room for them on the payroll, which, as I said, is better done on day two than day one. So having some depth and seeing how things go in training camp and then maybe being in a position to pull a trigger on an early move. I mean, Carolina doesn't start paying Falk until day, day one. So it's not like there's bonuses or anything else involved here. So uh, if they're looking to ship out that, that salary, they can do it just as easily early in the season as in the summer. I, uh, one thing I like about Yarabek is he's played a year in North America already. So he's like OV2 was last year, right? Yeah. Who played who played a year between New Jersey and uh, I think Utica, their farm team in the American Hockey League. So he he's he's not fresh out of the European package. He he should be he's seasoned a little bit in North America, and um, that's a, that's another good thing about the signing. What did you think, Bruce? Uh, the Scotty Upshaw signing. I mean, the, the one thing that stands out is he. In the last three years, he's been one of their top three forwards in terms of ice time for penalty kill mm -hmm. um, with Kyle Brodziak and um, Alexander Steen. Um, and so he's he's been counted on heavily there. The Oilers suddenly have quite a strong group of people. Um, you know, they have Upshaw, they have Brodziak, Strom did a good job, Kara did a good job, RNH has done a good job, Cassian's not done such a great job on the penalty kill, but they've got at least six guys without having to resort to using Connor McDavid anymore, who, who I'm okay if they use in the last 20 seconds of the, of the PK. Um, but I don't want McDavid out there blocking shots. Like, honestly, I, if he got injured blocking a shot, I just would, on the PK, I'd think like, why, why are you employing that player in that job? Um, and I know that a lot of skilled players do that job, but I just, I just would question that. So Upshaw can do that. And, um, his points scoring hasn't seemed to, it's never been great, but it hasn't seemed to drop off at all in terms of points per minute in the last, he's just the same as ever, isn't he? Yeah, you know, the deeper I look at his uh, at his um, uh, statistical package, the happier I'm becoming with this, I can't call it a signing, I guess it's an agreement until they sign. Uh, but he's actually... Earned his last two jobs came after PTOs. Apparently, he's had he's had two of them in the last three years before this one, and made made the team both times. Anyway, in St. Louis here, he's uh, you know he's a, he's played 32, 33, 34 year old seasons there, so you know that could be sort of your Mark Letestu range of your career. Uh, he scored 14, 18, and 19 points in a, roughly 70 games per season. He's been about an even plus minus. And you know what? He scored zero power play goals, zero power play assists. In other words, those points are all bought and paid for, and mostly from the fourth line because he's playing. Here's his ice time, 1057, 1059, 1051. Do you think he's getting consistent usage in St. Louis? Fourth line, playing the wing killing penalties and just, you know, being one of the troops. And last year, uh, at least last year, he played quite a bit with Kyle Brodziak. So they have the familiarity of being teammates in the immediate past, which is, a, you know, to me, it's an advantage for both players to potentially line up with a guy they, whose game they already know. Uh, so I see a lot to like in that sign. I mean, you know what? Yeah. It's like Jason Chimera, like no signing that he's dropped off as he's getting older here. And this, some players, if they're fast and in shape, can keep playing well. So, yeah, I thought that was a really strong signing. And then then it frees up. Like if you're going to trade for Falk, mm -hmm. who knows? You might have to give up a forward like Kajula or Kyra or um, or one of the your, uh, Cassian, one of these guys uh, who are slated for the third or the fourth line. I mean, I don't want to see Kyra move, obviously. I really like Jujar Kyra. But um, that's a possibility that that kind of player would would go over in a trade. So you, Scotty Upshaw could, uh, you know, you bring him in just in case, and, and of course, just in case there's injury as well. Um, he he provides some depth there. So again, this is, you know, it's the kind of move like when Steve Tambellini was building the team. He, he kind of, mm -hmm. I think he had that one year where there was actually a bit of a window to win, like with Kruger as the co. Mm -hmm always was good to go and and they just but they didn't have the depth players on that team the right depth players on that team they they is that the year they brought in the summer of Belanger, Belanger and Barker and and yeah. uh, Hortichuk mm -hmm. and 
and eager. Mm -hmm. Like they brought in all the wrong depth players, it mm -hmm. seems. Just guys who were past it are never going to make it. And it really screwed the team. That Like that's a team that could have made the playoffs. And mm -hmm. you make the wrong moves and you pay for it. So, I mean, obviously those at the time, there was sort of hope that those guys would perform at previous levels or maybe reach the next level. And that's all we have right now with uh, the guys the Oilers have signed. But I actually like their chances. I think they're more proven players. And uh, it's not like you you sign Scotty Upshaw and say, okay, Scotty, we're going to put you on McDavid's line. I mean, there's zero chance of that. And that's not what they're looking for. And it's not what they need. What they do desperately need is some experience on the wings. And, I mean, the Oilers have got so many, you know, NHL guys with 100 games or whatever that are playing on, on, the, on the wings. And just to have a little bit of depth further down the lineup. And, uh, I mean, guys like Scotty Upshaw and Kyle Brodziak, that's what they bring. So we're talking Stanley Cup here, obviously. Well, I mean, Jacob Jarabic, Jer right? I mean, one year in the NHL, one Stanley Cup. I mean, we might as well go get that guy. <laughs> <laughs> My thoughts exactly, Bruce. Uh, he crushed it. He crushed it. Isn't you know the bring in the bring in the ring? You know, guy with the ring. That if they if they have a press conference and they say, did he win? So he was he on the team when they won the cup? I, like yeah, I saw, well, he played he, in Montreal and Washington. Did he, he play played. with? He played two games in the playoffs, I believe. Is his name uh, on the cup then? Uh, well, it would only be if he played, if one of those games was in the Stanley Cup Finals, and I don't think that it was. There's weird rules. You have to play 40 games during the season with the team or, or uh, at least one game in the finals. No other series need apply. So he played. Uh, so if they bring up the Stanley Cup, uh, we have a Stanley Cup winner and a proven NHL winner in uh, J Jakub Yarabuk. People's heads <laughs> will explode all over the Twitter sphere. He played the two games that lost against Carolina, the, or Columbus, sorry, the two overtime losses that began their playoffs. Remember when it looked like Washington was dead in the water? Down, lost two home games in overtime, first two playoff games, and they wound up winning the Cup after they took Jakub Yarabuk out of the lineup. That's so all we need to know, man. He's not a winner. He's a playoff <laughs> choke artist. <laughs> yeah, trying to read the tea leaves, eh? After some of these resumes, I mean, at the NHL level, we got a half a season split between two teams. So uh, you can you can guess as to uh, what kind of player he is. But I think the OV2 comp, I mean, even if OV2 hadn't played on the Oilers, like he could have pulled that comp from any other team and say, geez, he's got a lot in common with this guy. And, and uh, I liked OV2 last year, Bruce. I thought he never gained the trust of the coaches, but he, I thought he, he, he wasn't as bad defensively as I figured he was going to be. And he moved the puck very well. He should, he never got a chance on the power play. I think it was one of the lot, like if, if, you know, there's a number of things which I have in my long, <laughs> my lengthy critique of the coaching last year, this isn't number one on the list, but it's certainly on the list was the, the, the not, especially after Secker was so weak. And then, I guess they just fell in love with Ethan Bear after that, and and he never did get a chance. So no, I I honestly I don't understand it, and to me that was a major black mark on the coaches. Now maybe there's things technically defensively that they said we just can't have that in the lineup, or whatever. But geez, we never he, saw that though. He, well, it wasn't obvious to me as a, you know not at that level obviously as the coaches are. It wasn't obvious that he was. I mean, sure he could get beat. Well, guess what? Every defenseman in the NHL gets beat. Uh, I, Especially I, I on the Oilers know, last year. OV2, he led the defense score, Oilers defense score, and goals per 60, assists per 60, and obviously points per 60. And they kept putting him back up in the press box, and their cut power play kept sucking, and they never kept, brought him down. They never put him in there. I just couldn't understand it. Sorry, I rant, but it, it was a real pet peeve with, uh, with uh, this watcher last year. Like, what? What'd you bring him in for? That's not really a rant, Bruce. Like, that's that. It's, <laughs> for a, me it's a runt. It's a runt of a rant. Yeah, okay. Is. That is that is a rant for you. Yeah, quit ranting at me all Feel the time. My ears getting red. There you go. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So um, we've decided these moves are good. Uh, we like them. 
And of course, we're optimistic glass half, half full or kind of Oilers fans. Yeah. yeah. There's some kind words from Jonathan Willis over at the Athletic. He, Jonathan liked the signing, and uh, it's, you know, it's, it's. I think I think they like the the uh, analytics guys like the OV2 signing as well, and they were right about that. He did turn into. I thought he was a credible hockey player. Now, hopefully, McClellan will maybe. Hopefully, Jakobin will do the things that he needs to do to win the confidence of the coach and play well and. This signing will work out for the orders because they could sure use it, and and it may be all there is. This may be it, Bruce. Like you know, we're we're talking about another deal. Like I've heard Tory Krug's name mentioned. Hagerty from Boston keeps trying to trade Tory Krug for Ryan Nugent Hopkins and Jesse Puliyarvi and first round draft picks and more first round draft picks and Leon Drysaddle. Oh, yeah. And but Tory Krug still is in Boston, and I I suspect he's going to remain there. So this could be it for the orders. This could be all they other than the signing of nurses to be their blue line. And I don't, I don't hate it because I think um, this allows you, I think you could put um, nurse. I th actually think nurse and Russell might be the second pairing. Um, Clefbaum and Larson, the top mm -hmm. pairing and Benning and Yarabek uh, as the third pairing with, well, Gravel and Yarabek will, will, will battle it out for the six, seven jobs. And it's not obviously, the best blue line in the NHL. It's probably in the bottom half, uh, and that might be charitable. But it's 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 not one of the worst. Um, and and when when these guys played well, when they were all healthy, that includes Sacker, of course. In the 2016-17, this was a good defensive group. So, yeah, I, I must admit, I'm setting my overall expectations, and and all in almost every area as well as somewhere in between. Uh, each of the last two years. Not quite as good as 16, 17, but not as bad as last year. Like I think their luck went from high to low, and I think we'll find a tide somewhere in the middle this, this season. But it's. Uh, you know who's going to be better than he was in 2016, 17, and 2017, 18? Mm -hmm. It's Connor freaking McDavid, and yeah. he's going to kick their ass all the way in, into the NHL playoffs this year, Bruce. It's going to happen. Well, McDavid will not be out of the playoffs in uh, April this year. If you have average defense and average goaltending, and McDavid, I like your chances. You know, I mean, he's a huge difference maker, obviously. And I mean, in a perfect world, you you know, you have a dynasty with great players at all positions, but in in the real world. You have uh, this one incredible superstar to build around that nobody else has. Um, Coach has figured it out. He's figured it out. R N H and McDavid. Yeah, he figured that out. Took him a while, Bruce. Took him a bit of bit of time. Uh, he's figured out Drysdale on the second line, leading the way there. I think um, it's got some defensive pairings that should work. So I think uh, with all those things. All, you know, all you need is is one or two guys to step up. Like, you know, you Clef Bomb, obviously you need Talbot to get re regain his form, but if Clef right. Bomb steps up and pull RV or Reiter or, you know, one more ratty, like one or like one forward, one defenseman and the goalie kind of mm -hmm. step up, we're we're good to go yeah. with Connor McDavid. And this is where having a having a guy like uh, Scotty Upshaw, I mean, as unimportant as, as it seems in terms of the bottom of the roster. Uh, you can afford to have one more of those dice rolls not work out and still have, you know, an NHL caliber player to keep in your lineup. And so if, you know, all of Aberg and Ratty and so on don't get it done, well, at least, you know, you got something reliable uh, at the end of the bench or in the press box or wherever. And I think they'll wind up signing him. I really do. Yeah, I think, you know, in Brodziak and Upshaw, they've improved over, I guess, Latestu and Hendricks from, well, Hendricks was in there last year. Who was with Latestu last year? Cass. On the bottom line, Cassian. Man, that's it's a guy who's got to pick up. Was the most up. regular one. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a guy that he may not be home and cooled out if they're looking for cap space. Uh, they just signed a, or well, they just came to terms with a potential legit replacement for Cassian. That's one way to spin it. Indeed. Well, let's leave it there, Bruce. Thanks for talking today. All right. Nice to have some real news to talk about in August, isn't it? 
It is. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.